We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night question. Tonight, we've got a follow-up on last week's topic of engine building. Yeah, so last week, as part of our discussion on the board game mechanic of engine building, one of the things we settled on is that engine building may not be a mechanic at all, but rather a board game type or a board game style of play. It's not a single mechanic, but rather something that comes out, of pl out during play because of a combination of other mechanics. Which leads us to tonight's topic, which comes from the first person ever to join our chat room here on Twitch and interact with us, Shadzar. They wrote, I would like to see a show defining game types. Like, what is a dexterity game? What is a legacy game? I want a The Tabletop Bellhop Guide to Types of Games. There you go. So that's what we've got for you tonight. I think this will be a good follow-up to last week. Now that we've decided engine building is a game type, what other game types are out there? While we are doing our best to be as inclusive as possible, I'm sure there are going to be some game types <laughs> we miss, or we'd set a new show, rec uh, show length record. <laughs> if we do miss your favorite game type, this would be the perfect chance to contact us and let us know what we missed. All right, due to the fact we're going to be covering a lot of different categories of games tonight, we are not going to spend much time on each of these. If there's a specific category you want us to deep dive, like we did for engine building last week, hit us up on social media or head over to the blog, click on Ask the Bellhop, and let us know you'd like to know more. So what I am going to do, uh, as we do get through, so Sean's going to give you the definition, our definition of the game, and then what I'm going to do is point out a few of my favorite games in each game category. That way you have some examples that show off each game type. Well, on to the list. Abstract. Games with little to no theme, no storyline, simple design and mechanic usually feature perfect information, little to no elements of luck or randomness. Right, the most well example here is, of course, chess. There's also Go, but then there's a lot of modern hockey games that also fit this category. Some favorites of ours are War Chest, Onitama, and the game Sean and I love the most out of all abstract games, The Duke. Next up is Bluffing, games where part of the game is lying to other players. They feature hidden information and can include elements of deduction. These also include games with hidden turn planning and hidden movement. So this one's a huge category, actually. There's a lot more bluffing games out there than you would think. The obvious ones are your social deduction games, right? Your Battlestar Galacticas and your secret Hitlers and whatever. But you know what? Moves where you plan your move in secret, like X-Wing, or programming your robots in Robo Rally, also in bluffing, as do many games featuring auctions, like Power Grid. And next we have card games. Games that use cards for the majority of the game. The line where a game swaps from a card game to a board game is a thin and wavy one. Mm -hmm. Some card games can feature a board, but to us that board just has to be a place to put cards. If you're doing other things there, then you have a game that uses cards and not what we would call a card game. All right, the obvious examples here are trick-taking games, right? Your traditional card games, your hearts and spades. Uh, then there's Sean's favorite board game mechanic, deck building. And games like Clank and DC Deck Building. But this also includes Euro games like Race for the Galaxy. Next up we have children's games. Games designed, designed specifically to be played by children. Most are intended to be educational as well as entertaining. Thankfully as time has progressed, designers have gotten better and better at making these fun for adults as well. Uh, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters remains my favorite children's game of all time. Great fun for the whole family, including just playing with adults. Other favorites include King Me and Go Cuckoo. Just so I'm not advancing too far in time, when my kids were younger, they loved the Haba games like Monza and Goblet Gobblers. Next, we have City Building. Simply ga games about building a city. These games are usually about efficiency and can be about building the most attractive city, biggest city, or the most lucrative city, or a combination of all that. Right here, I can't think of any other game except Suburbia. There are others, but that one is the shining highlight of city building. Fair enough. Next, we have Civilization Building. Games that have you develop an entire civilization over a large span of time. While most Civ Building games go from ancient times right into science fiction, others focus on a specific, small time frame. These games usually feature some form of technological advancement system, as well as a system for warfare. 
Uh, through the ages, a new story of civilization is considered by most hobby gamers to be the best civilization game out there in this category. But this also includes games like Genesis, which just focuses on ancient civilization growth. Next, we have collectible games. Games where after getting the core game, you can add content to the game by purchasing additional modules, usually released at a set schedule. There is usually a competitive actual play element to these games, and in order to stay competitive, you need to keep up with the various new releases. Some of these games feature random packs and elements of various rarity. Uh, the big boy here, of course, is Magic the Gathering, the most well-known collectible game, but this also includes any game with waves and waves of expansions, like, say, the Morp's most popular Marvel Champions right now, or X-Wing or Imperial Assault. Next, we have Deduction. Games where players need to come up with answer answers based on information presented in the game. There are a wide range of different deduction games types, from social deduction, bluffing games, to cat and mouse, and hidden trader games. Now, Clue, of course, is the most widely popular and well-known deduction game. Code Names is a popular deduction-based party game, and I recently discovered the Chronicles of Crime series and have been really impressed by them myself. Next, we have Dungeon Crawlers. Players explore, explore some form of dungeon, fight monsters, and accumulate treasure. This can be episodic or campaign-based, cooperative, or one verse many. Note, dungeon here doesn't necessarily have to be a fantasy-style, go under the ground, around, surrounded by stone cavern kind of thing. Imperial Assault is one of my favorite dungeon crawlers, and it's a Star Wars game. Space Marines. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Space Hulk could yeah, be space, another one. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have game books. Now, while some people will debate whether or not these are board games or not, what we are talking about here are the various game books published over the years. These involve the player or players taking on the role of characters and flipping the various parts of the book to complete some form of adventure. Another type of these has two players face off against each other, each with their own book. Now, examples of game include the classic fighting fantasy books. Uh, my personal favorite back in the day were the Way of the Tiger books and dueling game books like Ace of Aces or the fantasy-themed Scarlet Sorcerer versus the Emerald Enchantress. For a much more modern look at this style of gameplay, check out Legacy of Dragon Holt from Fantasy Flight Games or the Adventure Games from Cosmos, which has replaced their exit series of games. Well, next up we have Dexterity Games. Games that rely on the physical skill of the players. This could involve stacking, building, placing, balancing, flicking, or tossing. Now, I, I think anyone who listens to the show regularly knows how much of a fan of dexterity games I am. I don't know why I love them. Favorites include Pitch Car, Hamster Roll, and lately, Go Cuckoo. Next up, we have the ever-popular Dice Games. Games that use dice for their primary mechanics. Similar to card games, there's a thin, wavy line that determines when a game swaps from a dice game to a board game with dice. One of the things we think that sets dice games apart is that the dice need to be rolled and can often be re-rolled. Uh, Yahtzee is, of course, the most well-known dice game out there. I personally prefer Farkle if we're looking at traditional dice games. For hobby games, I love Istanbul the Dice Game, perhaps more than the original, and I'm also a big fan of Roll for the Galaxy. Next, we have economic games. Games all about generating income and having the most income at the end of the game. These usually include some form of market system, which could be stocks, but also includes any system of trade. Note, this income doesn't have to be money. It could be any other resource. For a great example of a game, that an economic game that's not about money, Look to Terraforming Mars. It's all about generating those resources and your terraforming rating. The, and then if you do want an economic game about money, my personal favorite has got to be Brass and or Power Grid. Those are both way up there. Well, next up, we have educational games, games that are meant to teach you something. For a long time, there was more of a focus on teaching than making games fun, but this has thankfully shifted in recent it's years. Uh, Robot Turtles was one uh, that was actually a big Kickstarter kiss, uh, success, which is a great STEM game to get kids into programming. Timeline is a very simple game that's great for teaching some history. But note, all these games don't have to be about kids. Two weeks ago, we talked about a ton of great games that could teach you about history, like Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Well, next we have Engine Building. 
Games where you start off with almost nothing and use what you do have to build up something more. Where you create a system and run that system to generate whatever it is you need to run the, to win the game. Now we spent a full episode discussing this and our favorite example just last week um, to, to just go find, uh, sorry, I wrote that weird. One of our favorite examples, again, Terraforming Mars, we spent an entire episode talking about this. Just go find episode 120. Listen to that. Tons of game suggestions in that episode. I think 16 of them, even though I think I said 15 while we were <laughs> recording. There's actually 16 because I can't count. I don't play enough economic games, I guess it is. But Terraforming Mars is, is my most played engine building game currently. All right, next up we have Exploration. Games involving an aspect of discovery where you will search new areas and reveal more aspects of the game as it goes on. Uh, the one that came to mind right away on this is the Seafarers of Catan expansion for Settlers of Catan, where you put some of the island tiles face down and flip them over. I think that's a great example of adding exploration to an existing game. For a nice heavy media exploring game, check out Mage Knight, where you slowly and randomly expand the map as you explore. Next, we have Farming. Games where players build up some form of a farmland. This usually involves growing crops and sometimes animal husbandry and or building up the buildings on the farm. Managing resources and gradual improvement are important elements. I don't know what it is with board game designers and board game teams and farms, but there are a ton of them. Look at it, almost anything produced by Uwe Rosenberg. Uh, personal favorites include Agricola and Caverna. Well, next we have fighting while very popular in video games there are a growing number of board games about close quarter combat these differ from war games in that they are about personal combat yeah for a board game version of street fighter or mortal combat check out the battle con series of games like war of indines devastation of indines and for something different take a look at spartacus a game about blood and treachery where you actually control a whole I can't remember, a house of gladiators, because I can't remember the term for what a house of gladiators is right now. Well, next we have horror. Simply, games featuring horror elements. Much like the movie genre may be attempting to be spooky, scary, gross, or terrifying. I meant to actually take this off the list. We took off fantasy, sci-fi, and themes. Horror theme probably should have been taken off as well. My bad for leaving that on. Um... A uh, big fan of Horrify is, is Horrified for a classic Universal Monsters look. And for something unique, check out Nyctophobia. So some good horror game recommendations. But I don't know if that's a type. That to me is more of a theme. Yeah. When we remove sci-fi and fantasy from this, we, we probably should have taken off mm -hmm. horror as well. And then we have Humor. Games meant to be funny and get players laughing. This includes a wide number of party games, but can apply to games with humorous elements as well. So Telestrations is the game I always think about when everyone talks about laughing at the table because every extra life we all make ourselves ill at about three in the morning from laughing so hard. An example of a game where humor is part of the game, but it really the driving force is Munchkin. It's more a more serious game with humorous themes. Uh, see, but wait, there's more is the first one that comes to mind for me. Yeah, that's a good one as well. Uh, next, we have Legacy Game, a game that adds some form of permanence with each gameplay. This could mean unlocking new content, or it could be modifying or destroying existing content. What you do during one game affects all future plays of that game. Uh, Gloomhaven is, of course, the most popular legacy game out there and has been for a number of years now, whereas Risk Legacy from Rob Davio is considered to be the first legacy game. For those people who don't enjoy destruction, don't watch Mo playing Gloomhaven as he giddily any tears legacy. up... <laughs> Jesus. Don't watch me play any <laughs> legacy game. Don't get the effect of will tear up the cards. All right. Math-based games is our next topic. Games with a significant level of math, where playing well is based on using math skills and doing calculations. So this is a, there's a huge range of games in this category, ranging from pretty much everything Rainier Nitzia has ever put out. Uh, one of the lighter ones that I still really enjoy is Kingdoms, to math-heavy games like Power or very math heavy games like Arkwright. The last time we played, people pulled out calculators in the middle of the game. Well, next we have mature or adult games. Games with adult themes, usually explicit humor or depictions of adult situations. 
So when I put this on the list, I almost kind of giggled thinking about it. But you know what? It's easy to dismiss this just thinking about games like Cards Against Humanity and those games meant to offend people. Games I'm not personally a fan of. But there are a number of games that approach adult themes well and reasonably. Examples, Consentical, Starcrossed, and even Time Stories has some really adult things where the first game in the setting is set in a madhouse and you are playing people who have uh, mental problems. And to be fair, on our last Extra Life auction, one of the biggest sellers and, and the things people were most interested in were a couple of adult-oriented uh, yep. games that, that were up for auction. So people totally enjoy fair. the category. Uh, next up, we have mazes. Simply games that feature mazes and or maze-like elements requiring players to navigate a path. I lost myself. Where'd it go? Sorry. Uh, Robo Rally is my favorite maze-based game. Uh, another modern one that's it's a lesser-known game from a Canadian designer is Quad Heroes that features a lot of trying to navigate your way through a maze-like board. Well, next we have memory games. Games where players are required to remember previous game elements, often combined with deduction. Now, note this doesn't just mean the classic game memory, where you just match cards. A uh, good example of some modern memory-based games are Hanabi. Um, my kids love the game Magic Labyrinth, where you're trying to remember what a map looks like, uh, an invisible maze looks like, which combines our last category. Next, we have miniature games. Here, we're talking about miniature battle games. Games where the miniatures are the main components and the game board or scenery on the table represents the physical area around the miniatures. Not every game with miniatures is a miniature game. Many of these games also include hobby elements like assembly, painting, and building scenery. So Games Workshop is still the 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 overarching uh, master of the miniature games, and there were various Warhammer games. There are a number of other miniature games out there, like War Machine, Infinity, or the growing popularity of Gaslands, which is post-apocalyptic and just uses uh, dinky cards. Next, we have Murder Mystery, games all about investigating a murder and trying to figure out the details of the crime and who the perpetrators are. See, this one, I wasn't sure if it should be a standalone category, if it just fits in with deduction. But there are a ton of games specifically dealing with murder mysteries. Now, personally, I'm a huge fan of Chronicles of Crime. Specifically, the 1400 was a lot of fun. But these also include all the, the party style games, the dinner party games, the how to host a murder, stuff like that. Not something I'm a huge fan of, but they add some LARP elements. So because of that, I kept it on here to counteract going with the fiction because of the, that whole RP LARP element to those murder mystery games. Next, we have negotiation. Games about making Sean, deals go, there we go. and alliances. Sean had frozen. Many negotiation games also feature the inevitable betrayal when those deals and alliances are broken. Uh, Diplomacy is probably the most well-known negotiation game famous for ending relationships. Uh, Chinatown would be a personal favorite negotiation game. Next, One vs. Many. A game where one of the players is competing against the rest of the players these games include games with Dungeon Master style player who controls the game, monsters, and many hide and seek games where one player is trying to hide from the others. Uh, Fury of Dracula is a very popular one versus many hide and seek game. And then the Descent series of dungeon crawling games is an example of one with that overlord or keeper or dungeon master. And most recently, the Ravensburger Jaws game. Yeah, that's a good example of one that does it completely different. First Next part's up, hide and seek. Next up, we have Party Game. Games that play a high number of players at once where social interaction is the key element and main goal. Usually very easy to teach with simple rules. All right, my favorite party games include Codenames, Concept, and one Sean mentioned earlier, but wait, there's more, which I got an expansion for for my birthday, so I can't wait to Ooh. play again. Next up, we have Point Salad. A game where there are multiple different ways players can score points with no particular way better than any other. Stefan Feld is famous for designing point salad style games. And my favorite Felds include Amerigo, Trajan, and Carpe Diem. But an example of a non-Feld point salad would be the sci-fi 4X game Eclipse. All right, well, next up we have print and play. Games where you are meant to print out the game components yourself or combine printed components with stuff most people have readily available, like dice and pawns. The game is published, 
in digital form. Uh, we recently reviewed the Roll and Write Roll for Lasers that was a print and play game. Absolutely. And uh, this year, this, this last year or so, it's been a, a major driving force in the game industry. Yep. And next we have puzzle games. Games where players must solve a puzzle. Could be cooperative games or competitive games. Many competitive puzzle games end up being co called multiplayer solitaire games. So the first thing that came to mind for me is the Exit series of games, the, the, the escape room games. But this also applies to polyomino games like Patchwork and games that include puzzles in them, like Mansons of Madness. Next, we have racing games. The goal in a racing game is the, to be the first player to reach some goal. That could be a finish line or a set number of points, which means this includes games about car or horse racing, but also many Euro games. Yeah, the best example of a racing game you don't think of as a racing game is your Settlers of Catan. It's a race to the first person with 10 points. Now, Pitch Car is a race to the finish. Camel Up is a twist on this where there is racing, but you're actually betting on the camels, not trying to get your camel to win. Now, next up, we have real-time games. Games where the players are meant to do something with a strict time limit. This can involve simultaneous play with players trying to compete uh, complete something before other players, or games with timers where players must stop playing or are penalized when time runs out. Uh, Fuse is a very stressful, cooperative real-time game. Galaxy Trucker is one of my favorite real-time games, and Captain Sonar turns the classic game of Battleship into a real-time strategy game. Note, this also includes games like the Exit series, where your final score is based on how quickly you complete the game. Next, we have role-playing. Now, we're still talking about board games here, not pen and paper role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. These games have players take on the role of a specific character and make decisions based on what character they are playing. They often feature some form of advancement system where the character grows over time. Again, Gloomhaven would be the highest rated role-playing game out there, but there are lots of board games with role-playing elements nowadays. Next, we have The Sandbox. And no, not the fun one you played with in kindergarten. <laughs> well, no board game is a true sandbox because all are limited in some way by the scope of the rules and the game components available. A sandbox game is a game where you are presented with a large number of options and ways to play the game. These include point salad games and games with multiple paths to victory. The most sandbox game I have played so far to date is Zaya Legends of Adrift System. This is a sci-fi sandbox where you start off with a ship and you can pretty much do what you want with it. Next up, we have territory building games. Games where players are attempting to take over as much of or a specific area of a map. These games often use area control and area majority mechanics or could be about making an enclosure. So most folk on a map games fit here. Uh, one of my personal favorite area majority maps, which I games, sorry, I've mentioned many times on the show is El Grande. But this also includes games like the Castles of Burgundy, where you're building out your empire with tiles on your own personal playing board. And while the most classic example of an enclosure game would be the classic game of Go, which has been around longer than any other game on this list. Next, we have Trains. Trains is another mechanic along with farming that board game designers can't seem to get enough of. There are any number of games based on railroads, rail routes, rail vehicles. These range from very simple to extremely complex. Yeah, there really isn't anything much simpler than Ticket to Ride, which features trains. Then you got games like Steam, which is a pick up and deliver economic game that kind of fills in the middle. And then, well, you've got your 18xx games on the highest end of that complexity scale. Next, we have transportation. These games are all about moving something from one place to another to score points. Almost every train game is a transportation game, but there are non-train transportation games as well. So a personal favorite of mine would be Keyflower, where you are transporting goods around your village. Uh, Zaya is another example where you could be a merchant and bring goods from one planet to another. And Brass is one of the best transportation games ever made, in my opinion. Next, we have travel games. Travel games where you move about on a map or a grid to different locations. May or may not include exploration, and something is gained by visiting a high number of locations. Uh, travel is an element of one of my favorite games of all time, Orléans, uh, even more so with the Trade and Intrigue expansion, and it is a huge part of Coimbra. 
Next up, we have trivia. Games that test players' knowledge about a particular subject or range of subjects. Uh, Trivial Pursuit, of course, the most well-known. Personally, I'd much rather play Wits and Wagers. Next, we have War Games. Games that attempt to recreate military action. These exist for pretty much every historic timeline, but also a, for a variety of sci-fi and fantasy themes. This category pretty much covers anything from small unit engagements to epic battles and multi-year wars. A Command and Color Ancients is my current favorite historic war game. If I want to go into the world of sci-fi, I am a huge fan of Star Wars Rebellion. And that would be my favorite non-historic. And for something completely different, but still a war game, check out Root with its cute little animals. Next, we have Word Games. Games where players are challenged on their vocabulary and knowledge of words and their interactions. Almost all of these are very language dependent. Yeah, Scrabble, of course, is the most well-known word game in, in the world. Uh, Letter Jams, the one I played most recently and really enjoyed. Uh, Codenames is a very popular party-based word game. And Just One is one on the top of my wish list. Well, that's it for our list of board games. Now we're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. All right, you fine folk. What do you got for us? What so there's categories a, did we forget? A lot of a lot of chatting uh, going on here. Uh, we have uh, let's see here. Poker is one uh, that's a bluffing game. It's yes. a card game. Uh, so there, there's what we missed. Okay, so what we should have had at the start of this or at the end of this is that almost every board game out there is going to be a combination of one or more of these. Yeah. It's very seldom you are going to find a game that is just one type or one category and what we're hoping is that i could take any game off my shelf downstairs and tell you which of these previous things we talked about it is combined because none of these are standalone so yes yeah. poker is a card game and a bluffing game and a deduction game i would say as well because you were trying to count the cards and i would say a math game because <laughs> you were trying you're doing if you're playing properly and a memory game so you got memory so like that's it's that's all part of just poker Yep. Right, because you're trying to remember where the cards are played. You're trying to count the cards are played, so you got math there. I'm not even counting the scoring. <laughs> and then you've got the bluffing, and well, and then there's an economic element if you're actually using betting. There's something we don't have on here. We don't have gambling games. Gambling games probably could have been on the list. That's one I think we missed. Yep. I think gambling is definitely a type of game that would apply to more than just poker slots. Uh, I'm I'm trying to think. I know I own games downstairs, where where you do it uh colt express is what type of game so it's programmed movement which is a mechanic um what would i see take that maybe should have been on our list so it's a program movement game but again we determined the program movement before it was a mechanic not a theme it's a western themed game it is a uh take that game which we do not have it's on a the fighting list. game it's, a train it's bluffing game. It's a train game. It is a fighting game, yeah, because there's indiv individual combat, interpersonal combat. Definitely not a war game. Um, uh, it's a memory game. Memory game, yeah. There's definitely memory elements. So I think having Take That, so here's a new one. Take That, which would be games where players are competing with the other players, doing, taking actions to interfere with the other players' plans in some way or another. I could probably come up with a better definition, not just off the top of my head. So those would be Take That Games examples being Munchkin, being the biggest Take That game out there, where everyone's trying to get to level 10 and everyone else is trying to prevent someone to get to level 10. So, there are Take uh, That elements in many games. As, as a quick crib off of BGG, competitive maneuvers that directly attack an opponent's progress towards victory, but do not directly eliminate any characters or components. All right. So they have that listed as a mechanic, not so a category. A mechanic, yeah. Yeah. See, that's a, the the whole what's a mechanic, <laughs> what is a category oh, yeah. is so messy. It really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yep. Like what I actually think we need to do is, is I was telling Sean this before we started, is just the tabletop bellhop list of game terms. Yeah. And mash both together. And, and honestly, I, I was I mentioned this in, in a sort of a joke when we were chatting earlier. But we could honestly do one episode a month of of definitions and keep that yeah. going for a year at least. I mean, there are Probably. just so many different terms used in board games, which are either 
uh, unique to board games and gaming or are used differently within board games and gaming. Uh, it's just, you know, there's a lot of language involved in the game industry. We could add a segment even or a once a month. I don't know. I, I, if you want to put the list together, we can define them. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think where we'd start. We want probably want to go alphabetical and how we keep track of what we've covered already and what we haven't. Yeah, we'd have to keep a shared doc of, like, you know, here's the full list of, of terms we've done and, you know, put yeah. a line when we... No, All right, I kind of went off on those early teen. What else did we have? Uh, that? We had uh, and people. People do love Farkle, uh, but also yep. we're bringing up Liar's Dice, which is both oh, dice a good game one. and bluffing. Yeah, Liar's definitely. Yep. Uh, Chinatown is that an economic game? Yes, there, there is that. It's an economic game. It is a negotiation game. Trading is a mechanic that is usually part of negotiation games. So that gets into that one. I actually have a very firm definition of. I, it is definitely a negotiation. This is the purest negotiation game ever played because everything is on the table. You can you can trade money. You can trade spots on the map. You can trade goods. You can make promises. You can even do a, I'll take this off my hand now and give you $10,000 in the last round of the game. Like, like everything's on the table, which is why I like Chinatown. Uh, Chinatown also includes um, area, area control and area majority, so territory building. I was trying to think of what we called it on here. Chinatown is also about territory building because you were trying to make sets of similar types of stores in Chinatown. There are a lot of mechanics, again, that go into Chinatown. Uh, what else do we have here? Well, Jeff Jeff is is partially trolling us and talk when he asks <laughs> us to talk about how not all games about trains are train games. And so how in Power this Grid case, is a train game, but Ticket to Ride is not. No, see, the problem is Jeff is confusing train games with route building games. Not all route building games are train games. In a train game, there has to be some form of uh, of, of doing more like upgrading, where you don't get that in Power Grid. You're, you can't improve your engines or anything like that. But in this definition tonight, we just trains. It's games that feature trains. Right now, train mechanics is definitely more to it. A power grid, I would not consider a train game. Yes, you're building routes, but that's route building. That's the reason I don't actually consider Ticket to Ride a train game. It's a train-themed game, but to me, it's not a train game. Right. Because there's there's no, there, there's a train theme, but it's, and, and it's, it's interesting. Rummy. This it's game, gin. This game, we actually had uh, more discussion about the Ask topic prior to the uh, show than possibly any other topic yep. we've had before. Because uh, there's just so much language involved here, whether something is a theme, a mechanic, a class, a type, um, you know, there's yeah, so many we're using different the types, words. style, and in, in, um, category are all kind of three of the same thing right. to me tonight. Because I know one of the things we talked about, uh, one of the big ones was sports games, right? Is yes. sports a theme or is it a type of game? Um, and we ended up, you know, things like um, sports, horror, uh, sci-fi mystery western became themes so we yeah. weren't discussing those tonight other than uh, we slipped horror yeah, i forgot i slept in horror accidentally but, I meant uh, to take that off. but we were calling those themes rather than types which is what this episode was about tonight what it was supposed to be about yeah <laughs> we, we tried so what i haven't seen is anyone mentioned anything we missed except for like i said uh, someone brought up express Colt uh, Express. I wonder if you can consider Colt Express a maze. Hmm. With the way you move on the different tracks. The main thing I was trying to think of is have I ever described take types that, yeah. of we games? Take, so take that. Yeah, is take that missed. should be it. I want to make sure we add it to the blog version. That's part of why. And I want to throw that in the lobby section here. So give me a second while I take a short note. I feel like there's probably, there's got to be more. But it's, I was trying to think of how, how I describe a game. Like if someone said, how would you describe Harry Potter House Cup competition? I'd be like, it's a gateway engine build or a worker placement game with engine building mechanics. So you tend to describe things by mechanics. By mechanics, yeah. Um, whereas a less um, experienced gamer will probably default more towards type and theme. Right. Because they, aren't as, they just aren't as familiar with all the individual mechanics. Um, and then occasionally, you know, sometimes they will confuse you know, well, yeah. theme for mechanic and, and mechanics become, you know, become things. Maybe, like, maybe the tabletop bellhop list of terms to describe board games. <laughs> and that, that'd that be both. Because it would just, yeah. not just board, because if we do board game terms, we've got to define like meeple and yeah. and all that. That's even bigger. 
that, well, and I, that, board game I, component <laughs> terms. Well, and, that's the thing, though. I mean, realistically, that's you know, and you get into Euro trash and or Ameritrash and yeah, we've and covered Euro that. And, and, you know, and and just getting all those terms defined, um, and and out there helps the industry really. I mean, you know, with the more people who understand the way people talk about games, the more people who can get into the the hobby. So that's actually been done. I was trying to find the name. Building Blocks of Tabletop Game Design and Encyclopedia of Mechanisms was written by Jeff Engelstein. And it just came out last year. No, sorry, two years ago now. I keep thinking 2019 still last But again, year. mechanism, again, mechanisms is only part of it. Yeah, though, but right? if you look at it, they they he does they break basically out the, say or they do they, it, hundreds of different mechanisms organized by category. Each has a description of how it works, of its pros and cons, how it can be implemented, examples of games. And it can be read for cover to cover, used as reference, and it's meant to have encompass all the themes and encompass like it's yeah. it's trying to be more than just mechanisms. So But I mean, but again that that book's gonna miss out on probably miss out on something like Meeple, right? No, so, that's a, yeah, that wouldn't have more trash. Games and, terms. And and I think and I think there's a, a more general um ongoing list of board game themes um where you know i don't i again and uh Anchi games is saying against smooshing it all into one list yeah um i don't know if you would maybe do one blog and then just add to that every time we did it on an episode or you know keep keep a blog updated with everything we've talked about or or how how mm -hmm. you would present that on the blog but uh i think uh, you know throwing in a five minute section in the podcast where we just added and talk about new words isn't a bad idea at all yeah maybe we can toss it in you and d work on the list and i'll give you definitions <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds like something else i gotta figure out every week um so anyway i should pick this up at some point it's jeff engelstein and isaac shalev i'll drop a link to it in the notes i like i should try to find a pdf of this like i'll write jeff and say hey or i just buy it i don't know i could i could just get the kindle version or something i'm sure oh my god Okay, so the Kindle version is ninety six seventy. Jeez, ouch. Uh, so maybe not. <laughs> the hardcover is one hundred and eighty three seventy one. Like, is this not MSRP? Well, no, Someone's that's marking it's, this it's up. Probably uh, like a textbook, right? Wow. Textbooks are always okay. That's that's more than I plan yeah. to spend just to check it out. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's supposed to be the definitive, and what they were trying to do with this book is come up with common terminology so that. People would differentiate area control and area majority and differentiate the same everywhere. Right. Which I, I appreciate the goal of this book. Um, Jeff went on a ton of podcasts promoting it back when it came out. I wonder, like, oh, I wonder if he does cool. a different uh, differentiation between the deck building and deck creation that we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's why that, I, that I'm like, I, I would love to flip through this right now and I can't. <laughs> because. Um, so it's broken into game structure. So competitive game, cooperative game, team-based game, solo game, semi-cooperative game, single loser game, trader game, scenario mission campaign games, score and reset games, and legacy games. So they definitely have some of the things we were calling types here. Right. And then turn order and structure, fixed turn order, uh, static turn order, bid turn order, progressive turn order, claim turn order, pass turn order, real-time turn order, punctuated real-time, Simultaneous action selection, roll order, random turn order, action timer, time track, past action token, interleaved in sequential phases, lose a turn and interrupts. That's just turn order and structure. Yep. That's, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely textbook material. That's why yep. it costs 180 bucks. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then by resolution, critical hits and failures. Rock, paper, scissors. I'm trying to see if I see anything about Game end and victory. Wow, there's a lot. There's race. Mm -hmm. Player eliminate. Player elimination we probably should define. Push your luck. Economics. Wow. Sorry, just this list is impressive. I, I should open this up for our research. Mm -hmm. Auctions. They, they have 16 different types of auctions. Worker placement is its own. Like, But there's they have eight different types of worker placement. The 24 different types of movement. So, so what they have, so area control. So instead of having area control, area majority, they call them all area control. And what they, what I call area control, they call absolute control. And the other area majority slash influence. And actually, I think that makes perfect sense. 
That's a good way to word it because absolute control is only you are in there. You right. control it. Whereas majority is you have the most or you have the most influence. Right. He also has troop types, territories and regions, area parameters, force projection, which has to be one of those where you control one area. So you have, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, with Tyrants the Underdark has that. Where yeah. because you have a thing here, you have influence on the spot next to it. Yep. Zone of control, which is another thing where you place a thing and you have control over a mount behind it. And line of sight, which is an interesting place to have it. Yep. Here we go. Card mechanics. So they have deck building as its own. Drafting is separate. So they don't have deck building versus deck construction. Right. Here. So I figured it out. Melding and splaying. See, that's one I never <laughs> think of. Which you played Innovation, where you splay yeah. the cards yeah, this yeah. way. Or you play them that way. All right. Well, yeah. I think wow. we're going to wrap this up. And as our last, I'm going to let uh, one of our Twitter followers get the last word in. Okay. Brock Wagner on Twitter says, there's only three types of games. Big box, medium box, and small box. No, I disagree. Look at <laughs> back there. What the heck's that? Stupid box? There's stupid box, too. No offense, Renegade Games. I like most of what you do. That's a dumb box. <laughs> Well, finally, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop.